All right, everybody. Uh, I guess we can start now. Um, today we'll be presenting a few works that were published from Safari, which is the name of owner's research group. Um, my name is Jeremy Kim, and I'll be presenting a couple myself. So we'll start off with the DRAM latency puff, which is a mechanism for quickly evaluating physical and clonable functions by exploiting the latency reliability trade-off in commodity DRAM devices. So also feel free to interrupt at any point um, and ask questions. So I'll begin with a executive summary. The motivation of our work is that we can authenticate a system via unique signatures uh, if we can ev evaluate a physical unclonable function or a puff on the device. And so these puffs result in puff responses, which are the signatures, and they reflect the inherent properties of the device um, due to process manufacturing variation. And so we can uniquely identify a device with these responses. So DRAM is a promising substrate for puffs because they are widely used um, and they are in most systems today. So if we enable puffs on DRAM, then we're enabling puffs for most systems and we can ident identify and authenticate any, any system with DRAM on it. The problem with current DRAM puffs is that they're either very slow um, or they require a DRAM reboot or they require additional custom hardware. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, the other puffs uh, today. So the goal of this work is to develop a novel and effective puff for existing commodity DRAM devices <clears throat> with low latency evaluation time and low system interference across all operating temperatures. So we call our work the DRAM latency puff, and we reduce DRAM access latency below reliable values um, that the manufacturer recommended, and exploit the resulting error patterns as the unique identifiers for the device. So in our evaluation, we experimentally characterize um, a lot of LPDDR4 DRAM devices, and we find that we can <clears throat> evaluate the DRAM latency puff in around 88 milliseconds, which is a significant speed up compared to the uh, prior DRAM puff evaluation mechanisms. And this is because the prior DRAM puff evaluation mechanisms um, rely on charge leakage rates, which um, significantly depend on the temperature. And at lower temperatures, um, it's much slower. So this is the outline for the talk. I'll first begin with the motivation. <clears throat> We want a way to ensure that a system's components are not compromised. And one example would be if that an attacker were to uh, maliciously swap out a healthy component with a malicious one at runtime in order to steal information. And so we can use a puff um, or a physical unclonable function and evaluate it on this device to generate this unique signature to the device and um, authenticate it and make sure that it's actually the device we think we're running on. And we refer to the unique signatures as puff responses. And oftentimes, these uh, puff responses are used in uh, challenge response protocols, which basically a system that wants to authenticate a device sends a request. Um, the device being authenticated sends a response, and then the response is checked um, in some large database that the authenticator has. So <clears throat> we'll show you um, how that happens with this little animation. Uh, the green is the trusted device, um, and the gray box is the device that we want to authenticate. So first we send a challenge X as an input to the device. The device evaluates the puff, um, depending on how it evaluates puffs. And then it returns a response um, according to the challenge. And then the trusted device checks this response against its database. And if it matches, then we authenticate the device and we can uh, trust that we're running on the correct device. So first we want a puff that is runtime accessible, uh, which means that the puff can be evaluated quickly with a minimal uh, performance impact on concurrently running uh, applications. The faster that you can evaluate a puff, the earlier you can detect whether a system component has been compromised and the better you can protect against a wide array of attacks. Secondly, uh, DRAM is also a promising substrate uh, for evaluating puffs because it's ubiquitous in modern systems. However, the current DRAM puffs are slow and get exponentially slower at lower temperatures. And this is because of the charge leakage um, relation. So now let's talk about what makes an effective puff. So I'll explain the um, characteristics of an effective puff using the same diagram uh, where the green is the trusted device and the gray is the device that you want to authenticate. 
First, we want repeatability, which means that if we send the same input to this device, challenge zero, uh, we'll get the puff response zero, and if we send the challenge again, we'll get the same exact puff response. Second, we want diffuseness, which means that we can send many of these different challenges um, up to n, where n is a very large number, and each of these results in different puff responses. Third, we want uniform randomness, which means that we can't use um, knowledge of a subset of these puff responses in order to guess another pair. <clears throat> Fourth, we want uniqueness, which means that across all the devices or the device types um, that we issue challenges to, um, any given challenge Z will result in different puff responses Z. Fourth, or fifth, we want unclonability, which means that we can't just simply take this device and manufacture a second one with complete information about the DRAM device. Um, and so this basically prevents you from spoofing a, uh, a chip that can be authenticated in this manner. And there's more analysis on the effective puff characteristics in the paper that you can read. So <clears throat> we also want to have a runtime accessible device, and this prevents um, these attacks that happen in real time. Um, so basically, we're preventing attacks that um, that run uh, on devices that haven't been authenticated yet. And so, if if something like if you hot swap a device while while running, then you, you might want to be able to run this puff authentication uh, after, not just simply at boot time. So first we want to have low latency in order to very quickly um, authenticate this device while even other applications are running. Um, so each device can quickly generate a puff response. And we also want to have low system interference uh, where the puff evaluation minimally affects the performance of concurrently running applications. So now we'll talk about the DRAM latency puff mechanism, but before we do so, I'll go briefly into the DRAM background that you need to know to understand. So <clears throat> as you all know, um, DRAM cells comprise of a capacitor and an access transistor, and the data is stored in the capacitor as high charge or low charge, uh, representing either zero or one, and the data is transferred via the bit line and amplified via the sense amplifier, um, and the data is read by activating the word line or driving the word line, which essentially opens up the access transistor so that data can be detected on that bit line. So now let's follow the uh, voltage on the bit line over time during an access. So initially, the bit line is held at 0 0.5 VDD. And when we activate the word line, the capacitor voltage or the capacitor charge begins to share with the bit line. And we call this bit line charge sharing. And after a certain amount of time, when the bit line uh, voltage has shifted far enough, the sense amplifier is enabled, and we can detect this voltage differential and amplify it to IO readable values. So after a certain period, we can read it, and the time between activating and reading is referred to as TRCD, which is a timing parameter that the manufacturers um, specify so that we are reading the data correctly. Note that this uh, graph assumes that the capacitor is filled with full charge, and if, it was, if, the, charge, if the capacitor was empty, the, the graph would just be inverted across the x-axis. So there is a threshold Vmin where when we pass this threshold, we could technically read the data correctly. But we want to ensure that there's enough guard band such that other cells that might be weaker and that might uh, reach V min threshold later can still be read correctly. And this is due to process variation during manufacturing. So we refer to different um, cells that, uh, that reach the V min threshold at different times as weak or strong. Uh, the later they reach it, the weaker it is. And so, <clears throat> Let's see what happens when we change TRCD. So when we actually reduce TRCD, um, we, are reading we are reading faster, but we do start to see faults in some of the cells. And this is because those cells may not have reached this V-min threshold yet. And so the lower you are below V-min threshold, the higher your probability is to fail. 
So let's go into key idea now. Um, a cell's latency failure probability, as we saw, is inherently related to random process variation for manufacturing. And we can provide repeatable and unique device signatures using these latency error patterns that we uh, induce upon these devices. So here's just a cartoon representation of an array of DRAM cells. And the larger and greener cells are stronger, and the smaller, redder cells are weaker. So <clears throat> the smaller cells here have a higher percentage chance to fail when accessed with a reduced TRC, and the bigger, greener cells have a lower percent chance to fail when accessed with a reduced TRCD. So the key idea here is to compose a puff response using the DRAM cells that fail with a high probability, such that it's very repeatable. So now, how can we determine whether in this array a single cell's location should be included in this puff response? We include the cell if it fails with a probability greater than a chosen threshold when accessed with a reduced TRCD. And so this involves accessing the single cell or every cell in this array multiple times and looking at its probability failure. So in this example, we choose a threshold of 50% 50, 50 and we access the cell 10 times or so, uh, count the number of times it fails, and if this cell's failure rate is greater than the threshold, we add it in the puff response. So <clears throat> what we actually do um, in the paper, we find empirically that when we induce latency failures 100 times and use a threshold of 10%, um, i.e. cells that fail more than 10 times, we get a pretty, uh, pretty good puff. So we do this for every cell in a continuous uh, 8 kilobyte memory region, and we refer to this memory region that we're inducing latency failures in as a puff memory segment. So again, here looking at this device, we run our algorithm and we get a puff response depending on which of the cells were weak. So <clears throat> using this methodology, we can evaluate the DRAM latency puff in only 88.2 milliseconds on average, regardless of the temperature. And this is because we can generate failures uh, pretty quickly re regardless of the temperature that we're accessing them at. Now let's talk about the prior best uh, DRAM puff, which is the DRAM retention puff. Um, and again, I'll talk first about the background necessary. So again, DRAM encodes information in leaky capacitors. Um, again, here's the same diagram of the DRAM cell. And there are many charge leakage paths where charge can leak in and out of the capacitor. Um, and if you leak enough, you'll start to see faults in that cell. So stored data is corrupted if too much charge leaks in or out. Um, Here's a cartoon where we initially, uh, here's a cartoon of the capacitor voltage over time, where initially uh, the capacitor is at a nearly 100% uh, charge, and over time it leaks. We also have the Veeamin threshold here, where um, above it we can read data correctly, and below it we can guarantee correctness. And so any time we read um, the cell, when it has a voltage above Vmin, is considered a retention success, and any time below Vmin is consider considered a retention failure. <clears throat> and the retention time is just how long a cell holds its value. And we can just find that here by looking at where that decay curve uh, crosses the Vmin threshold. <clears throat> So every cell has a different retention time, um, and this is due to process uh, manufacturing variation. And DRAM is comprised of many of these cells, um, eight gigabytes around, on, on the order of gigabytes. And so the key idea of the prior work is to generate a puff response using locations of cells in a puff memory segment that fail with the refresh interval n. And so here we have the diagram where greener cells have a longer retention time and redder cells have a lower retention time. And so when we weight uh, refresh interval n, um, we see that charge begins to leak out of each of the cells. And some of these cells result in failures as they leak faster than others. Um, and other cells don't fail because they can handle a longer refresh interval. Uh, and the pattern of retention failures across this memory segment is unique to the device. And again, that's due to process manufacturing variation. 
So <clears throat> we use the best methods from prior work and optimize them for evaluation on our devices for comparison against the DRM latency puff. So there's a few weaknesses that we first like to point out on the DRM, or the DRM retention puff. Uh, first, the evaluation time is very long and leads to high system interference. Uh, first, because most DRM cells we find to be strong and you need to actually wait a significant amount of time in order for enough charge uh, to leak from the capacitors. And so also, um, most prior work assumed that we need around 512 bits of information, of location information, um, in a memory segment in order to uh, uniquely identify the device. <clears throat> and so it turns out that uh, a failure rate for retention time of 512 out of um, our memory segment is quite high. And so because we see that a lot of cells have very um, long retention times, this gets, even, this gets only worse at lower temperatures uh, because charge leaks uh, slower with lower temperature. And so that results in a very long evaluation time for um, the retention puff. Uh, there's also very high system interference because DRM refresh can only be disabled at a channel granularity, which is on the order of gigabytes. And so this either means that we disable refresh and generate this puff response in this puff memory segment of like eight kilobytes um, and completely destroy all the data in that entire channel. Or we can either, or we can uh, issue manual refreshes to the DRAM device in order to maintain data correctness in the rest of the channel during the evaluation time. And because of the way DRAMs are made today, we can, it, it, it's a lot higher overhead to just simply issue manual refreshes to each row in that channel. And it also consumes a significant bandwidth on the DRAM bus. The long evaluation time can be reduced in two ways. One is to either increase the temperature, which results in a higher rate of charge leakage. Um, so we can observe the failures faster and find the 512 bits in that memory segment much faster. However, it's very difficult to control DRAM temperature in the field, and also operating at high temperatures is undesirable uh, for the chip's uh, general health. Also, we could increase the puff memory segment size in order to contain more cells that are weaker and find more cells to fail. Um, this will result in observing more failures faster, but it would require a large puff memory segment, and this, is, this becomes a pretty high uh, DRAM capacity overhead, especially when you need to, uh, especially when you're using DRAM and you need to like, reallocate data in order to um, evaluate a puff in some region. So <clears throat> in order to evaluate our mechanisms, um, we tested the LPDDR4 DRAM devices um, of two gigabytes in size from across three major DRAM manufacturers. And we used a thermally controlled testing chamber um, that could have an ambient temperature of 40 to 55 C with a very precise um, temperature. Uh, and we also held DRAM temperature at 15 Celsius above the ambient. We also had precise control over DRAM commands and their timing parameters. And so we tested retention time by disabling refresh and we also tested accessing with reduced latency by, dis by reducing the TRCD timing parameter. So now let's talk about the results that we found. So here uh, we will show the evaluation time of the different puffs. Um, on the x-axis we sweep the temperature and on the y-axis we sweep the evaluation time. <clears throat> and note that the y-axis is a logarithmic scale. So here um, because the DRM latency puff does not depend on the temperature, uh, we can evaluate it uh, with constant time uh, very quickly, regardless of the temperature. Um, and this is around 88 milliseconds. And we use an 8 kilobyte uh, memory segment for this. We also, in order to compare, we uh, test with many different uh, DRAM manufacturers, um, chips from different manufacturers, and with a eight kilobyte memory segment size. And we find that uh, it takes significantly longer to evaluate uh, retention puff um, than it does the DRAM latency puff. Um, and this is orders of magnitude regardless of 
uh, how high you put the temperature, um, at least in our uh, testable range of temperatures. We also try increasing their memory segment size to 64 kilobytes, and this is actually the correct uh, comparison point that we, we compare against because we have a bunch of metadata where we're actually counting the number of failures per cell. Um, if you remember, we have to induce failures 100 times and see uh, which cells fail 10% of the time or more. So <clears throat> our overhead is 64 kilobytes and theirs is also 64, but we still have a significant um, speed up compared to that, also regardless of temperature. And we also increase it to 64 megabytes and still we have orders of magnitude um, faster uh, with much lower capacity overhead. We also test this with the different uh, DRAM manufacturers and we find that they're generally um, around the same amount of time to evaluate their puffs um, and we do this for manufacturers A, B, and C. So on average, um, <clears throat> we, we, we are still orders of magnitude faster than the previous DRAM puff with the same DRAM capacity overhead, and that's the 64 kilobytes. So now let's talk about system interference. During puff evaluation on commodity de devices, the DRAM retention puff must disable refresh at the channel granularity, which is on orders of, uh, orders of gigabytes and also issue the manual refresh operations to rows and channels that are not in the puff memory segment but in that channel in order to prevent data corruption. And it also has long evaluation time at low temperatures and so during this entire evaluation time we have to constantly refresh um, the rows in that channel <clears throat> which takes up um, DRAM utilization as well as bandwidth, uh, DRAM bandwidth utilization or DRAM bus utilization. Uh, the DRAM latency puff, on the other hand, does not require disabling refresh and also has a short evaluation time regardless of the operating temperature. So there's a bunch of other results in the paper if you're interested. Um, we look at how the DRAM latency puff meets the basic requirements for the effective puff uh, that we mentioned earlier in, this, in the talk. And there's also a detailed analysis on the devices of the three major DRAM manufacturers the evaluation time of a puff, further discussion on optimizing retention puffs, uh, system interference of DRAM retention and latency puffs, the actual algorithm to quickly and reliably evaluate the DRAM lat latency puff, um, these design considerations, uh, overhead analysis, <clears throat> and yeah, please feel free to look at the paper if you want to know more. Um, to summarize, uh, the, our motivation was to authenticate a system with unique signatures um, by evaluating a puff on it, and these puffs are inherently um, unique to the device because of manufacturing variation, and DRAM is very promising because it's widely used. Um, unfortunately, the previous DRAM puffs were slow, required a DRAM reboot, or required additional custom hardware. Um, <clears throat> so our goal was to provide a novel and effective puff for existing commodity DRAM devices um, with low evaluation time and uh, low system interference across all operating temperatures. And so we proposed the DRAM latency puff, um, which reduces the DRAM access latencies to induce failures across a region and use those errors as the unique uh, signature. In our evaluation, we characterize real devices and find that the DRAM latency puff can evaluate much quicker, uh, orders of magnitude faster than uh, prior best DRAM puff evaluation mechanisms. So that was the DRAM latency puff. Um, if anyone has any questions, yes? Isn't there some noise between each measure of both the retention time and the latency? such that the puff would be markedly different? Yeah, so there are differences, um, and this can be due to external factors such as temperature. Um, <clears throat> but the way that people actually handle it right now is to actually use um, a similarity comparison. And so we're not looking for exact matches of puff responses. We are actually using a Jacquard index which is basically like the union over the, yeah, the full set. Um, but 
Yeah, th that, that's a good question. Yes? Could you use the DRAM to uh, gener <coughs> generate random numbers? So that's actually the next talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the latency puff, um, we're inducing the failures, and these failures are um, how we uniquely identify a device. And so we, in the DRM latency puff, we induce them by reducing the timing parameters to values that are beyond specification. And in the latency puff, we are in the retention puff, we're disabling DRM refresh which is the way that they um, maintain data correctness in DRAM today. Um, and so if we turn off DRAM refresh, then we start to see these retention failures. Yeah. Can you uh, give a concrete example of where we use Puff? Yeah, so, um, I, I mean, I don't know how concrete you're talking about, but <laughs> We, our, our threat model is that there's a attacker that wants to maliciously swap out a device in real time. And so <clears throat> if you have authentication on this device, um, all right, so <laughs> if you have a DRM device and you swap it out with some potentially malicious DRM device that doesn't act, in a way that it's supposed to, but it has the same interface. It could just be sending whatever data you want it to send, right? But if you're able to guarantee that the, the device that you put in um, is the device that you want to be running on and acts according to how you want it, then you should use a puff to authenticate it and make sure it's the actual device. But if someone hot swaps it with this malicious device that does whatever the attacker wants, then it should fail the puff because it's an actual different device that uh, won't generate the same uh, response responses. So first you have to run a multiple puff on a lot of data, store it, and then uh, ask the same things, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> You don't necessarily have to um, evaluate every single possible puff. Um, you can just have a few key puffs and then just ask those because technically you could ask any of them, but you only have to store a few of them in order to actually authenticate. Yeah. Okay. So if. Uh, you come up with any questions or ways to improve this work, feel free to email me. <laughs> uh, I guess we can move on to the second talk, which is the random number generator. <laughs>